This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Ron Wyatt was an amateur archaeologist in the 1970s and 80s who claimed to have found several of the world's most sought after biblical artifacts. But some say it's all a hoax. Kevin Fisher presents compelling evidence that Ron Wyatt did indeed conduct digs and presents thought-provoking video that verifies Ron's claims. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom Torah fans, welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Ron Wyatt is a huge reason why A Rude Awakening International exists. Ron was a friend of Michael's. Uh, we've had Ron's widow, Mary Nell, and her husband, Randall Lee, on the show, uh, who also promote Ron's discoveries, by the way. They still do that together. And tonight, we welcome back Kevin Fisher who presents Ron's discoveries like no one else. And tonight, it's the first of three episodes of Ron Wyatt Revisited with Kevin Fisher. And before we get to my co-host, let's get to the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar, where we are on the fourth and final Shabbat of the eighth month. Now, please welcome my co-host, Angie Clark. Welcome Shabbat back, Angie. Shalom, Dr. Scott. Thank you for having me. Certainly, certainly. You know, uh, so we talk about Ron Wyatt and Michael, and you know, Ron did a dig uh, at the Temple Mount that a lot of people just kind of forget about. Uh, we're right. going to talk about that in the episode tonight, but uh, right. Michael spent many years in Israel. Yeah. And like um, 20 years. I think. 20 years, yeah. Lived there on and off, back and forth to the U.S. And, mm -hmm. and, um, at, at, and at the time of this taping, mm -hmm. uh, Israel has been at war with Hamas for almost a month. Yeah, long long time. It's, you know, things are obviously really bad over there. And we were just looking at uh, one of the pieces of the the love gift this month, uh, which is pictures from around Jerusalem. And we were just kind of saying, gee, I, I hope all of this stuff that right. uh, the pictures were taken of it is still there. Um, so yeah, we just, just we need to remember thing. Israel in in our prayers. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it, it's no fun living over there, over there right now. No. Um, you know, Ted Clayton, who is our CEO, he has the uh, alert, the red alert app right. on his phone so he can see what's going on with Israel. And it's going off constantly. I know. It's not stopping. You know, that's what a lot of people forget about. You know, a lot of people kind of pick on Israel saying, hey, you know, the, and, and of course, our people in our audience, you know better, but you hear this all the time, I'm sure that, you know, well, yeah, there was this one attack, but Israel just keeps pummeling. <sighs> Gaza, the rockets have not stopped coming from Gaza. Thousands. This is what we need to remind people, and it's not about you know, these people versus these people. There's good people on both sides right. kind of stuck in the middle here. Right, right. And so we need to pray for everybody involved because Absolutely. even those who are trying to help, like in Gaza, mm -hmm. who are not from Gaza, Right. are getting hit, right. uh, and they're getting killed just from you know trying to help out. Just innocent people. Yeah, and innocent people. Yes, we do need to always remember Israel in prayer. Yep. That's the, that's the apple of Yehovah's eye. So. so, Angie, this was kind of impromptu. I wasn't gonna ask you to do this, but would you mind praying for Israel? I would be honored. Okay. I would be so honored. Would you join us? Okay. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the one who was and is and is to come, we thank you, Father, that you are our great commander in chief and you're a perfect leader. So we trust you in everything. Father, we thank you that you have promised that Zion will be a praise in the earth. So Father, thank you for aligning Israel to take on that role, to become that praise in the earth. And Father, we are asking for a quick solution to this. And we are asking, Father, for no more fatalities and help everybody rebuild quickly in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for doing that, Angie. Yeah. And you know, um, on the flip side, we have uh, good things to talk about uh, yes. with testimonies. You yeah. know, that's the whole reason we do this. Yeah. And uh, we wanna talk about the testimonies because those are the lives changed. You know, if, there, if nobody's life was being changed, what's the point of doing this? There is no point. Right, this, exactly. That is the point. That's the point, yeah. Yep. Michael wanted to change you know, minds about you know, what he saw in the Bible and say, hey, look, we're missing something. Right. And that's why he started A Rude Awakening International. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, 
we want to just um, thank everyone for supporting what's going on here at Rude Awakening because lives are still being changed. So your gifts to this ministry do matter and they, they make things happen. And right now we're actually ramping up toward the end of the year where we're trying to see how much more we can help make happen next year. So if you would uh, just prayerfully consider that, please, as you're thinking about the end of the year, and if there's uh, something extra you can do so that we can plan for next year, that would be great. And so, Angie, we have somebody's life who has been changed. Oh, absolutely. Uh, by this ministry and yes. doing just that. So, You know, I just randomly chose these because okay. there's so many testimonies. I mean, we could do a whole series on just testimonies. <laughs> we really could. Seriously, where this ministry has changed people's lives. So this is from Karen Wilson. She said, I was a hopeless drug addict living in Kentucky with my husband. I found a teaching he had from Michael Rood. I listened to it several times and when my husband got home, I told him, I have to leave or I'm going to die. He agreed and I left for North Carolina. It took another year to completely recover. My parents were already in, in, this, in Hebrew roots and I listened to Shabbat Night Live every Friday for sure. I've also listened to his teaching sometimes all day long. This is sweet. Please tell him my story. I want him to know his powerful words from Yehovah changed my life. Mm. My friend and I watch Shabbat Night Live every Friday. We are praying for Michael's complete recovery. We love all of you and praise Yehovah. Shalom. Mm, beautiful. And you know, Karen's story is more than what we see there. Because mm -hmm. I remember when it first came across, we'll have to share more of her story later. Yes. But uh, she actually was stuck in, at first she, she, she was in drug addiction. And then I believe it was after that, uh, got roped into the whole- uh, um, Lifestyle. Lifestyle, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the whole uh, lesbian lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then she escaped that. Yep. And so, yeah, all kinds of struggles she's been through. So she's uh, seen a lot of stuff that she can help a lot yes. of people through that. And, and, uh, and this ministry, Michael's teachings are such a, a fantastic conduit yeah. for Yahovah to change lives. It's, it's not us that does it. No. You know, it's not us. It's mm -hmm. not Michael. He's the conduit that Yahovah uses. And, and uh, I tell you what, there's so many of these testimonies like this, lifestyle changes, uh, drug addictions, uh, just loneliness, sadness, all of it that yep. um, God has used this ministry to help change lives. Yep, and even just uh, something as simple as, you know, uh, coming out of out of debt and things like this. People have, yes. you know, realized that they could do something that they didn't realize they could do before or something or whatever, just through prayer uh, and having people pray for them. And that's another Founding. thing. Yeah, it is. And so there's, uh, we have a spot on our website where you can place a prayer or the beautiful thing is, if you want to pray for somebody on that prayer page, you can mark that you prayed for this. Yes. And that person gets a notification that said, hey, someone just prayed for your prayer request. Yes, yes, yes. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a powerful tool for those who are looking for ministry. They're looking for mm -hmm. something to do, somehow, some way to give of themselves. And so there are intercessors standing by, yeah. watching that prayer wall, just waiting to go to war on people's behalf. So it's really amazing. Yeah, it's it's not just everybody in this building. No. Here. This is you know, this goes out to, if you are a supporter of A Rude Awakening in any capacity, whether you pray or give or whatever, I mean, this is your ministry. This is, you know, exactly. this is for you to give to other people. So we wanna thank you for being part of the crew. Really. And our, our ambassadors, they're diligent about watching that prayer wall yeah. and praying, so. Awesome, so there's the prayer wall information at the bottom of the screen. So if you haven't taken a look there, uh, this would be a good opportunity to go and take a look there and maybe just uh, say a prayer or two uh, during this Shabbat for somebody. Okay, thanks, Angie. You're welcome, Scott. All right, so Kevin Fisher sheds new light, new video footage, and new eyewitness accounts and new details of the incredible archaeological discoveries unearthed by the late Ron Wyatt. But first, now it's time to get your bread and wine because Michael Rood is up next with the Kiddush. From Nazis and NASA to the ancient days of Noah, Deception has been the enemy's greatest tool to turn man's attention away from the Almighty and to think more highly of himself. But there's one deception coming that is more dangerous than all others. All nations are still ruled under Babylonian ideals and, and understandings. It never went away. Okay? The spirit of Babylon, if you That's know. right, it never went away. In The Great Deception, former NASA team member David Beverly reveals the mind-blowing deception we've been under since the beginning of time. Who's behind it? And why most believers will never see the greatest deception of all, right at our doorstep. This teaching is not available anywhere online, 
but we'll give it to you as our thanks for supporting A Rude Awakening International. When you donate $50 as a love gift to this ministry in November, we'll send you The Great Deception with David Beverly on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll send you The Great Deception, plus the word Shalom, spelled in letter art, a four-foot photo collage from locations throughout Jerusalem. Donate $300 and we'll send you The Great Deception, the Shalom letter art, and a solid walnut challah bread board featuring the words Shabbat Fayom Tov in Hebrew. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rue to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Thank you. Your donations ensure that important teachings like the Great Deception keep coming from a Rude Awakening International. Use your smartphone to scan the QR code on your screen to donate now and receive these limited time gifts. Or call 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, said that David, King David, was a prophet who saw before him the coming of the Messiah. He saw that his son, the Messiah, would be the Kohen Gadol forever after the order of the Melech Zadik. And Yeshua, ordained as the Melech Zadik, as the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, brought forth bread and wine in Yeshua. On the night in which he was betrayed, brought forth bread and wine and interpreted the very thing that Abraham saw so many generations before. Yeshua took bread and he spoke this blessing. Baruch atah Yehovah elam heinu malak ha'olam. Homotzi lechem min ha'aretz. And he broke the bread and he said, this broken bread represents my broken body, which will be broken for you. By my stripes, you will be healed. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm paying the price. Then he took the wine and he said, Baruch atah Yehovah elahinu melech ha'olam. Barei pari ha'gafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, creator of the heavens and the earth and the creator of the fruit of the vine. And he said, this represents the renewed covenant, which will be paid for in my blood. As often as you break this bread and you drink this cup, you exhibit what I've done for you because I am making you priests and kings. I'm paying the price. Shabbat Shalom, priests and kings. Wow. What a time to be alive. We look all around and we see all of this disaster, all of this tyranny, all the rest of it. But what did Yeshua say? Look up, your redemption draws nigh. We should be excited. And one of the most exciting things we ever did on the stage, we're gonna talk about again, it has everything to do with where we are heading, the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant. And there's no greater expert on this subject, in my opinion, these days than Kevin Fisher. Kevin, welcome to Shabbat Night Live. Nice to be here, thank you, Scott. You've been here before. Yes. But for those who, who have never met you before, uh, explain a little bit about, about who you are and what you do. Well, I'm retired. I worked for the state of Tennessee 30 years as a tax auditor, created a lot of friends. <laughs> But um, Thank God for retirement. Yeah. <laughs> but um, in 1984, I met Ron White in Nashville. Nashville's where most of the state employees work. And Ron was speaking at a church there. And I got to hear him talk about these things. And I was enamored with what I heard. And I said to myself, I would love to help him someday. Mm -hmm. And so later on, you know, 99, 2000, 2000, I went out to Noah's Ark. I, I just... Bill Fry had a tour going, the first time in years, and I started up my website, 
And it's just amazing the discoveries. One thing after another is coming out to be exactly what Ron White said. Ron White was used of the Lord. And um, yeah, and who is Ron White? For those people yeah. who say, I've heard that name, sure. who is this guy? So Ron Wyatt, he found these things, the Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, Red Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai. He was a nurse and Methodist in Nashville, Tennessee, worked there uh, for many years. But in 77, he went out to look for Noah's Ark. It had been featured in Life magazine in 1960, but cast aside as a natural formation. And so he went back out there and refound the ark site, and God performed a miracle along the way, stopping their taxi where they needed to look. I mean, this is incredible. And, and Ron's, Ron's an amateur archaeologist. He's an amateur right? archaeologist, yeah. nurse anesthetist, but before he went out and found anything, Scott, he was praying to the Lord, Lord, help me find something that will help someone get to heaven. This wasn't about, Lord, I want to get rich and famous. No, it was about, I want to help somebody get to heaven. And God partnered with him there on the very first trip, finding the ark, the sea anchor stones, the remains of Noah's house. And he, that was a 22-year journey that started at that point hmm. from 77 to 1999. And along the way, he found these four major discoveries, the Noah's ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, Red Sea crossing, Mount Sinai. But our topic today is about the Ark of the Covenant but um, so Ron, he's 100% genuine uh, Christian. He wanted to do the Lord's work. He sacrificed, we estimate he spent a million dollars of his wow. own money. You know, he would earn money. He wasn't rich, but he would earn money and spend it going overseas 140 times. Wow. That's a lot of effort, a lot of money. So he had skin in the game. Yeah, and he wasn't, I mean, I remember you telling me before, so, so Ron is no longer with us. He passed in 99. 99. And, but he lived not a, uh, an extravagant lifestyle. He lived in a duplex, and he just gathered yes. his money just so he could go again. It wasn't until the last couple of years he moved yeah. out in the country, but bought a modest home out in the country, you know, with a mortgage and so forth. And um, so, yes, he sacrificed financially for the Lord, you know, to do this work. God partnered with him. He said he used the Bible, various research books, and prayer to help him locate these sites. Mm. And so God wants these sites to come in, into view, into public view. They have a message to give. Look at Noah's Ark. It tells us that God had to destroy the wicked. Sodom and Gomorrah, God destroyed the wicked. The Red Sea Crossing, the wicked Egyptian army destroyed. God's people were led through in each of these, though. And, at, and with the Ark of the Covenant the, in Mount Sinai, the tables of stone were written that will be judged by. So God has a plan for these to be shown to everyone on earth during the Mark of the Beast showdown, I believe. It's going to be pushed out through the media, and the world's going to learn about these discoveries, including the Ark of the Covenant that we're going to go into but so Ron Wyatt, here he is at the Red Sea Crossing. Uh, this is one of the four discoveries that are plainly in view. The Ark of the Covenant is not plainly in view. But Red Sea Crossing, another fantastic place the, that Ron Wyatt found. But let's take a quick look at the, at the discoveries, just a two minute video here. God has preserved and is now presenting evidences of all of the major events that are mentioned in the Bible. Here we see Sodom and Gomorrah, these ashen formations along the western side of the Dead Sea, these sphinx shapes, for instance, Masada in the background, brimstone. They form a north-south line along the Dead Sea, the western side. Here's the more brimstone. Here's bone that I found there. Here's Noah's Ark. It's across the valley from Mount Ararat. It's the exact biblical length, Scott. Visitor center is there. Metal on the side of the ark. Sea anchor stones have been found that hung from the ark. Red Sea crossing, you see the pillar. It was on opposite shores where Solomon erected these pillars here at Nueva, Egypt. Uh, here are the chariot wheels that have been photographed. Here is the beach there at Nueva, Egypt. And in the foreground, you see the melted beach where the pillar of fire stood. Mount Sinai here 
in Saudi Arabia, the Golden Calf Altar, Mount Sinai in the background. Here's Moses' altar, the Burned Peak. This is incredible stuff. Split Rock of Moses is on the western side of the mountain. Golgotha, the place of the skull here, near where the Ark of the Covenant is found. The Garden Tomb, the Zedekiah's Cave, where the Ark was secreted, and the Crucifixion Site is there in the Garden Tomb grounds, and underneath that is the cave with the Ark of the Covenant. And so this is incredible what God is bringing about. These four discoveries, like I say, are plainly in view. You can go to arcdiscovery.com and take a look at them. So our topic today is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, some people will say, uh, I can see the, these four discoveries, but when he's talking about the Ark of the Covenant, that's over the top. I mean, he must be lying about this. That doesn't make sense. These other four discoveries are clearly real. They're authentic. God worked with Ron Wyatt. And then he turns around and lies about the Ark of the Covenant. God knows the future. God knows who Ron Wyatt was. And it's inconsistent and not logical to say that he would be lying about the Ark of the Covenant when God partnered with him on these other discoveries. Well, it's, it would be like saying that John, the apostle, is a liar because he wrote Revelation. Well, that was just some weird dream he had and wrote it down. Well, we don't discount Revelation. Right. Right, but it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, so consistency here. Um, he had the most credibility of anybody to claim to have found the Ark. Ron did not release the clear photographs and other evidence we're gonna see here. He kept it private because he felt God has a timing for this to be shown, but uh, we can, take his word, he's a very credible person, for what he saw, and we're gonna show some, some evidence showing that it is real, such as metal detection, detecting the gold. We'll see that later in the programs. But um, I received an email from this lady, Ron was there uh, giving her her epidural, and she said, hi, I knew Ron White 16 years ago. He gave me my epidural when I was to give birth. Ron stayed with me until my son was born, but he was not breathing had no heartbeat. So this is an email from the mother, okay, she sent to me. She said, I was screaming, I looked up for Ron for answers. I saw him kneeling down in the corner of the room praying. So here is the layout in the delivery room. And as God is my witness, the whole room lit up. The nurses were talking about how you could feel the presence of God in that room. Mm. Wow. The room lit up. So imagine a supernatural light coming on in this room with Ron White praying. And then she said, then my son started to breathe. Hmm. Her son came to life. She said, Ron was my angel. Now, how many people do you know that have prayed and someone came to life? And the supernatural light came on in the room showing that God, the Holy Spirit was there. Ron had a connection with God. He didn't have the connection with the devil. Like some people want to say, this guy's a bald-faced liar. That's totally false. That's evil for people to say that. And Ron didn't take credit for saving the baby. He just prayed and let God take the glory for bringing the he baby. He did, I never heard Ron talk about this, but this lady emailed me, so I brought it out. You know. So, so our topic's the Ark of the Covenant. Here's an intro video for, for the Ark of the Covenant. So the ark, it was used in the most holy place of the sanctuary, the one compartment 
in the back of the tabernacle, or later it was in the first temple, and that compartment was only used one day a year in the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would go into the most holy place, as it was called, to atone for the sins of the camp. And we have a video here of a priest going into the most holy place. In a reenactment, he's wearing white linen, going into the most holy place. He would take in blood first from the blood of a bullock to atone for his sins, and then he would take in blood from a goat to, for the sins of the people. And here is, this is our Ark of the Covenant here that uh, Jeremy Cohen donated, but this priest here is going to sprinkle the blood on the right side. They were always told by God would tell them to sprinkle the blood toward the east. And we'll go into that in more detail uh, as far as the east, north, and so forth, how it was aligned, the Ark of the Covenant. So the blood was sprinkled here to atone for the sins of the people that had been brought into the sanctuary over the course of the year. And this blood was atoning for the sins of the people over that 12 month period. Now this replica, this is a recent, recently new to you. It is, we'll show some more pictures later, but this is, yes, uh, it's exact replica according to Ron White's description. So yeah, that was the Day of Atonement when the Ark was used once a year. So 586 BC, Scott, um, the temple, the first temple, Solomon's temple was attacked or sacked by the Babylonians. In 2 Kings, it mentions the bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord and the carts, the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord. The Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried their bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered. So these are things the Babylonians took back to Babylon. Where is mentioning of the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the mm. altar of incense? There's no mention of these major items. Good point. What happened to them? So, what about 2 Maccabees? Jeremiah found a cave dwelling. He carried the tent, the Ark, and the incense altar into it, then blocked up the entrance. Some of his companions came to mark out the way, but were unable to find it. When Jeremiah learned of this, he reprimanded them. The place shall remain unknown, he said, until God finally gathers his people together and shows mercy to them. Then the Lord will bring these things to light again. So this is a hint here that Jeremiah hid the ark and the other furnish furnishings in a cave. This is consistent with what Ron Wyatt found. Here was Ron in 1978, their first dive, they found the chariot wheels and he's getting ready to go up to Jerusalem. Now quickly mention the chariot wheels, these chariot wheels, they have metal hubs. Some people said that this is table coral, that's totally false. These hubs have been checked with underwater metal detectors showing that there's metal in them. And if you go to the Egypt Museum, you'll see that the Egyptians did use the, the metal hubs. So, Ron, 78, he was leaving the Red Sea Crossing, going up to Jerusalem on his way to Tel Aviv to fly out, and he had an experience that we're going to hear about here shortly. It was in the garden tomb grounds. John 19 said the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So the crucifixion area had, had a garden near it and a new tomb. So these things should be together. And this is the site we're going to take a look at in our programs here. This is the garden tomb grounds. This is the garden tomb here. It's very popular. This is sort of the Protestant location for Jesus' burial. This is inside of it. Jesus was placed here on the left side. Six, about 60 feet in front of it, you see this wine press, one of the largest in the Jerusalem area, showing that there hmm. was a garden, ah. like to crush grapes or whatever. And then about 50 feet from that is an underground cistern, water cistern for collecting water to water the garden. So once again, we have a tomb, we have a garden area, and so Ron found the crucifixion site. 
Here's Golgotha, the place of the skull. It's about 100 yards away along the same cliff face as the garden tomb. Mm. So this is a sign of execution here. Golgotha, the place of the skull. So Ron Weiss can tell about his first experience at the crucifixion site when they were walking to the back of the garden. I had had an unusual experience. The Lord had helped me find the remains of Noah's Ark. He had helped me find the remains of Egyptian chariot parts and horse parts and people parts in the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aqaba. And I had gone to the Middle East with my sons. We had trained as divers, scuba divers, and we were going to get some of those chariot parts out. Well, <clears throat> due to my carelessness, I got sunburned to the point that my legs swelled up, my feet, and all this, and I couldn't get my diving equipment on. So I was up in Jerusalem hobbling around, feeling very, very rained on, <clears throat> waiting for my cheap airline ticket, the date that was on it to arrive so we could fly home. We didn't have the money to change the ticket. And uh, during this time, I was hobbling around the city a little bit. And one day I met this archaeologist who was in charge of the Jerusalem area there. So Ron's arm was lifted and God spoke through his mouth and said, there's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. Now Ronnie and Danny, Ron's teenage sons, were there with him. And in my recollection, yeah, we, we were. were there. And we saw Dad say, hey, yeah. that's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant's in there. So and we saw him yeah. do that. So they witnessed Ron's arm being lifted and him saying, there's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. So this was a real event. Ron pointed out the cutouts in the rock face where the signs were placed, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. You can see them today there in the garden tomb grounds. Um, and that's what Ron spotted in his first trip there in 1978. We, we had said, we had, Dad always had us reading books on Sabbath, you know, instead of watch TV. So I was reading Acts of the Apostles. And uh, it came across the quote from Maccabees about Jeremiah having his uh, servant secreted in a cave and all that. And uh, we kind of, whatever, I kind of said, Dad, how come we don't go find that? You know, you'd already found Noah's Ark. You know. <laughs> Is this after his arm had stuck out? No, this, this was before. Before. Okay. before that even happened. Okay. Yeah. And, and he said, Dad started questioning it then. He goes, well, I don't even know if it's still down here. It, I don't know if it's in heaven or not. Some people think it's in heaven. Some people think it's down here. And he started studying up on it. And then we went back overseas and we went to the garden tomb, you know, just to look at it, basically. Yeah. And that's when it was just the tourist his arm thing, went what up. We were doing. Yeah. And he said, you know, that's... And at the time, when we walked in there, Dad said, see those cutouts? And you yeah. remember? Uh -huh. And this was like the first time we had ever seen the garden tomb. And yeah. Dad walked around there, showed, pointed his finger, then he showed us the cutouts. All right, wow. Yes, so that was where the dig was gonna start in that area, it was January 1979, where they were gonna start the dig. Hmm. And it's strange that today you see bleachers there, right? And do they even recognize what is right behind them? 99% of people don't realize what that is. Wow. Yes. So it's, it's very, very sad. You know, it's not being broadcast. The Garden Tune folks don't want to broadcast this, unfortunately. Okay. So, well, yeah. Well, we'll talk more about this in a second. So hang with us. Okay. You hang with us, too. Thank you for being here on Shabbat Night Live. Thank you for bringing Kevin to us. Your donations make this happen. You give now. You let other people see this into the future. To me, this is one of the most important things you need to be showing people. This is hinting of what is coming. So make sure you donate to this program. Let others see this. Thank you for doing it.
thank you for supporting Shabbat Night Live. During the break, we grab this little thing right here. This is a piece of brimstone that Michael was given from the Sodom and Gomorrah area. And uh, Kevin, what we're seeing here is, well, it looks like kind of an eggshell egg situation. So yes. uh, what, what is this? I wouldn't eat this. <laughs> it's not a nice egg. But um, inside is the unburned monoclinic sulfur. This is unique sulfur that God rained down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The typical sulfur you find around volcanic areas is the rhombic sulfur. It's only 50% pure. This is 95 to 98% pure mm. sulfur. It's special. This is a hardened shell because when this was burning, there was a liquid around this. It turns to a liquid, the outside, and it's a purple flame. And this got snuffed out by some type of ash, and so it quit burning. So that liquid turned into a hardened shell. That's what you have here. So inside is the unburned portion. On the outside was this that was on fire, and it cooled down and hardened. So that's what we have there at the Cities of the Plain. So that's pretty obvious that something unique happened here, and yes. what else could it be? Right. And as Michael has made, explained in his uh, videos as well, that the walls of Sodom and Gomorrah are still there. They look like hills, but they're not hills. Yes, there are all kinds of formations there showing man-made construction uh, that fits the biblical description. You have the ash there. These are ashen remains. Mm. That's not soil that we saw in the images. Those are ashen remains. And so this is a warning to people, you know, that God had to destroy the wicked. You know, we've got to wake up and, you know, and, and serve our Lord instead of being led astray. So it's incredible seeing the Sodom and Gomorrah sites. The more you walk through there, the more you see. It, mm. It's incredible. So, yeah, so our topic here is the Ark of the Covenant. And so they were going to start their dig there. This is where Ron's arm pointed here at this trash pile. I mean, so unassuming here, this, this primitive site is where they started the dig. When we first started, it was full of trash and junk, cans, a dead cat or two, you yeah, know, it rats. Trash it, just, it was just a trash pile. Mm -hmm. So we had to clean it all out. Got sick. Yeah, we got the flu and just felt terrible. It was pretty miserable. Yeah. And as soon as you tend to get under the ground, it seemed like you uncovered a thousand fly eggs or something. It seems like they just, whoosh, the flies were just everywhere. Yeah, there's bones. And flies and mosquitoes. And we started digging. We, we found a little hand hold thing carved out up top of the grotto there. And so we thought, well, you know, we'll start digging to the left of this because it looks like they use this to, to kind of lower, lower something. something down in or to pull something yeah, out with. A hole in the rock. And so we started digging there and we dug straight down. And then we went to the right along the face. The Mount, face of the mountain. Yeah, the face of the mountain. Yeah. And we one, we'd have one guy in the bottom of the hole one guy in the middle and one guy up top to dump the buckets. So they started the dig at this site here along the cliff face. And here is a still image of some of the dig crew, for instance, at one particular point. There was nine people here. On the left side here is the, the rock escarpment where the dig was being done. There are some people out there saying a dig never happened. I mean, it's totally absurd. This is in a very public area. This is Ron going down into the dig site. And what year was this again? It started in 79. Okay. Yeah. And in 82, he found the ark. How did they ever get permission to do that? It was a divine appointment. I'll bet. You know, um, the Garden Tomb folks uh, gave him authorization and the IAA, Israel Antiquities Authority, you know, gave him a permit. So Ron went down by himself, or are there other folks down there with him? In this example, there's a couple of guys with him. Okay. I understand some of this was quite a tight squeeze, too. Yes. Ron had to exhale in order to get through some areas going to the arc. Yeah. On the end of the jackhammer. Ron Wyatt, welcome to the Ark of the 
Covenant Dig. Uh, we've been working in this uh, area since uh, 1979, and uh, shall we say it hasn't been an easy job. In 1982, we were able to get into the chamber where uh, we saw some of the furnishings from the first temple. Now, we accomplished that by going down through this hole here that's about 40 foot deep and then coming out of there back up into a chimney in a spelunker terminology and then squeezing on into the chamber. Now, if it were just simply getting into the chamber, we could do that. But once we get in there, we have to have the ability to get all of those things out of that chamber and safely to the surface. So it's not like just treasure hunting where you go in and, and get whatever is there and take it out. We have to consider taking care of the objects that are beyond this wall. So this is evidence here at this particular document. It's by Dr. Bill Shea of the Biblical Research Institute. He wrote a letter to someone responding to their inquiry about Ron and his dig permit. And uh, Dr. Shea was an archeologist and an MD. Mm. And he had talked to the Israel Antiquities Authority. You see here a line two. Yes, he did have a permit from the Department of Antiquities to work there for several years. Um, but Ron stopped his digging around 1991, so this letter is about eight years after the fact. But Bill Shea did talk to the authorities numerous times. He had connections with them. And he, in this letter, is confirming that, yes, Ron did have his dig permit. Now, here's the Israel Antiquities Authority website. I grabbed this still screenshot off their website around 2006. They said a trial excavation was conducted within the Garden Tomb compound north of the Damascus Gate. The excavation on behalf of the Antiquities Authority, funded by two foundations from the United States, Wired Archaeological Research of Tennessee and Biblical Archaeology Foundation of Texas, was directed by Y. Zellinger during the 1980s. Ron Wyatt excavated several underground chambers at the site. The current excavation cleaned the former chamber. So here they're admitting Ron found chambers in the 1980s. So folks that say he never did a dig, he never had a permit, that's totally false. They on their own website are admitting that he did a dig there and found chambers. So Ron is gonna tell us about the dig for the ark. And there's some computer graphics here while he's talking, not actual images inside the, uh, the ark chamber and so forth. So let's take a look at this very important video. When I found the cutouts, we were digging along the cliff face, and the, the dirt out here was beginning to threaten to fall in on us and bury us. So I went to the left, dug a shaft straight down. So as we tunneled along at the quarry floor, at the base of the wall, I found the cross hole. And I worked around and found some more cross holes four feet lower on the real quarry floor. I prayed, Lord, where shall I go now? I was impressed to break right through the cliff. Not this cliff, but one that looked every bit as solid. Right? Well, <clears throat> I'm dumb. But I didn't think I was that dumb. I knew there were caves in there because honeybees were coming out of cracks and flying in. So they had their nests in there. And my older son is rather a quiet person. He said, Dad, did you pray about this? I said, sure. Yes, I did. He said, well, I said, I was impressed to break through that cliff right there. Yes, yes, yes. And he said, well, let's do it. And I said, no, that's stupid. I am not beating my brains out against a cliff. He says, well, Dad, pardon my saying so, but I've seen you do stupider things than that. <laughs> I said, okay, tell Ronnie to pass the tools back now. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see a crack right here. 
That's right. right. It's not much of one, but it is a fault line through that stone. So we went 18 inches over to this side, took our hammers and chisels and started marking the stone up and down and up and down. Finally, a big chunk popped out of there. Pushed it off to the side, looked back in the bottom. There was a small, dark hole about that big. Didn't look very promising at all. I had my son hand me the flashlight. We had had him sitting where we could see. This was all down in a tunnel. And so I put it up to that hole, and there was a big cave chamber back behind there. Have you ever had goosebumps and all of that sort of thing? Just overwhelm you? Well, that's what happened to me. It didn't take us very long to make the hole big enough to get in. I thought the Ark of the Covenant would be sitting right there. It wasn't. <laughs> okay. So since we had to leave the next morning, we plugged that hole, we came back to the surface, plugged the hole, fixed everything up so nobody could tell where we had been, and left. I had to go home, work, save up some more money, and come back. But eventually, I found the Ark of the Covenant, and it was in a chamber that I would not have bothered going in, just like I wouldn't have bothered breaking through the wall. The, the little Arab guy that was letting us eat at his restaurant, he was a full-grown man, but he's about that tall and small, the teeth. So as we went through this cave system, he would crawl into the chambers, and I'd give him a light, and he'd shine it around, and I'd peek through to see if it looked like anything in there. So we did this over and over, and uh, we came to this one hole after we had, I mean, you wouldn't believe where all we had gone in that cave. We had just been all over the place, up and down, different levels, and at this point in time we had gone about 45 feet down and then back up, and here this hole was in the wall, about that big around. And it, there was a stalactite hanging right down the middle of it. It's the only stalactite I had seen in the cave that wasn't just little ones. This was a big one. So I broke it off, made the hole big enough for him to get in. And he was crawling in there. And I started to hand him the light so he could do what we had been doing you know, several days. He came tearing out of there. His mind, uh, eyes were big as human eyes can get. And he said, what's in there? What's in there? I'm not going back in there. And I said, well, what did you see? He said, I didn't see anything. And I thought, well, okay. Now, he had been in tighter places than that and had not responded that way. So I got this little beam of light, you know, in a very dark place here. <laughs> and I thought, that is divine terror. You know, that's supernatural terror. So I figured there's got to, that is either where the Ark of the Covenant is or it's the way to get to it, one or the other. And God doesn't want this fella to know. So I made the hole big enough for me to get in. I got in there and folks, it was full of rocks. Bigger than these here. When I found the Ark of the Covenant in that uh, chamber, all of the furnishings had been covered by a layer of animal skins, on top of that a layer of wooden boards, and on top of that enough stones to fill the rest of the chamber up to near the roof, up to within 18 inches or so of the ceiling. If this young man hadn't been terrorized and come scooting out of there like he did, I would not have gone in that place. But who needs rocks? We've been moving thousands of them for three years. So anyway, I crawled in there with the flashlight, and I crawled around on top of the rocks, and I shined the light down between the cracks in the rock, and there a gold flat gold thing uh, reflected back at me. So I moved over and shined down to another. There was two 
reflections, one here, one there, and one over here. So I knew it was a flat gold top. And I thought, the Ark of the Covenant, I forgot about the cherubims, you know, sitting on top. They'd have been poking up through it. That was the top of the mercy seat. But anyway, I started moving these rocks, and I stuck them everywhere I could. By the time I got down to that gold surface, I had them behind my shoulders, leaning back against them, and uh, it, turned, it was the table of showbread. Well, hey, that's not a bad thing, huh? But anyway, I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and it was only then that I took time to carefully examine the rest of the chamber. See, I had just crawled in, took a quick look, and started checking down under the rocks. So as I moved the flashlight along the wall, I saw a stone box sitting against the wall about this low, this much space between it and the ceiling. The lid was broke, slid around, and right above it was a crack with dark brown looking material at the bottom of, on the bottom of this crack. And I was able to see the top of the lid of the box. On both sides of the broken pieces was more of this brown stuff. All of a sudden I realized I was sitting in front of the Ark of the Covenant, and that Christ's blood had come down. What I saw was dry blood on the lid that had been busted and slid around, and there's dry blood on both sides of that break. So I knew the blood had gone in. But I knew in my heart the Ark of the Covenant was in there, but I didn't know by sight that once I regained consciousness after I became aware that the blood of Christ had gone on the mercy seat. You know, I hadn't a clue. And when I started digging, I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant. I had no idea that was the crucifixion site. I found that out as I dug down that escarpment. And so anyway, when, when I realized this, I passed out. When I regained consciousness, here I was in this hole way down in the earth, had to go 90 feet approximately to get out of there back to the surface. We found this January 6, 1982 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When Christ died and the earth shook and the rocks were rent, a crack came right down the entire face of the escarpment, right past the left side of the cross hole, and the stone opened up. Down below, 20 feet below, God had arranged for the Ark of the Covenant with its mercy seat, if you please, his earthly throne, to be positioned right down there 600 years before in 586 B.C. <coughs> when the Babylonian army destroyed the city. When the centurion stuck his spear in Christ's spleen and probably left ventricle to make sure he was dead before he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea, when he pulled that spear out, the separated platelets and serum of the blood of the Son of God gushed out, went down through that crack onto the mercy seat, and that ratified the old covenant and the new covenant. So Scott, amazing. Christ's blood going down onto the mercy seat. Ron White finds this Ark of the Covenant in the cave. And it's, it's just amazing how God arranged this, this scenario where the cross was put above the Ark of the Covenant and Christ's side was pierced and his blood fell out onto the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And we're told in the Bible that it, it gushed out. So it wasn't some little yes. trickle. So it makes sense that all of that liquid could make it through those rocks. And, yes. you know, and you can't make this stuff up. I mean, Yehovah can orchestrate this stuff. Uh, not no you, way no one could have thought this, this up. It's just incredible how God did get that on the, the western side of the mercy seat. Right, because yes. the, the western side was never used. It was, it was left right. vacant, that's right, mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, God had to create this plan because the Jews did not accept Jesus. If they'd accepted him, 
on Passover day, he would have said, slit my throat, take my blood in. That would have been the cleanest way to you know, create a sacrifice of himself. And instead, he had to be tortured to death. It's very sad. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to continue more about this. You have a lot more to present to us. Thank you for bringing all this information. And again, sure. your website is arcdiscovery.com. That's right, yeah. Okay, so we encourage people to go there and learn all about this and get all the details because there are some people that are going to say, oh, that's not true. Oh. We're going to show evidence after evidence. That's after evidence. right. So. It's totally true. <laughs> and we'll talk about all, all some of these uh, wonderful artifacts we have here on the stage as well. So uh, yes. you come back next week if you can. Yes, I'll try. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right. And you come back next week. At least try. Come back next week like Kevin is, okay? <laughs> so thanks very much for watching Shabbat Night Live. Until we see you next week, Shabbat Tov. Have a good week. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new michaelrood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.